the man. I really splurged on that $200,000 that Dodard left behind. Just when I thought we could finally relax after my husband's funeral, an unexpected statement echoed through the venue. Nick, with an inappropriate and nonchalant demeanor, said such a thing. At that moment, all the relatives in the venue were stunned, turning their gazes towards Nick in unison. What does Nick's? What's this about $200,000? What do you mean? I asked, filled with surprise and skepticism. Nick has always been careless with money, and there have been many troubling incidents before. But this amount he mentioned now truly shocked me. Well, you see, there was this car I've been dying to have. It's a new model, very popular, so it wasn't easy to buy. I ordered it and waited three months for it, and now it's finally been delivered. Man, the daughter kicking the bucket was really lucky for me. Nick explained, laughing and showing off the bank account statement for the insurance money he received from our deceased husband. Hearing his story, I felt a surge of anger, but then, looking at the documents Nick was holding, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Tiffany Adams as well, that's unfortunate. I was secretly glad to have such an oblivious son. As I thought this, I quietly laughed to myself. I'm Tiffany Adams, a 50-year-old housewife who works part-time as a florist. My family consists of me, my husband Dan and his son from a previous marriage. Nat, Dan had a history of divorce, and Nick was his child from his former wife. I couldn't have children with Dan, so Nick became like my own son, whom I raised. I first met him when he was just five years old. Initially, Nick was shy and hesitant towards me as his new mother, reluctant to open up. But after living together for a year, he gradually warmed up to me, and I vividly remember the first time he shyly called me mom. However, that took Nick, who was once a straightforward child, began to avoid Dan and me during his adolescence, and during a rebellious phase. I accepted this as something common in many families, but Nick's rebelliousness lasted longer than expected. As a high school student, he started hanging out with notorious delinquents, changing both in appearance and personality. The cute Nick who used to call me a mom seemed to have disappeared, wandering the streets late at night, often picked up by the police, leading to constant conflicts with Dan. To break this cycle, Dan and I tried to get him into a prestigious university, but he failed to get admitted and ended up attending a lower-ranked college. I believed that even at a low-ranked college, Nick could still graduate and find employment if he worked hard. However, as a university student, he continued his aimless ways. His activities expanded, and as an adult, he dove into gambling like casinos and slots, leaving us at a loss on how to stop him. I hoped that in a few years, Nick would find a job, move out, and live independently. Contrary to my expectations, he quickly faced academic failure in college, already facing a repeat year as a sophomore. I worried about how long it would take him to graduate and what his future would hold. Then a tragic event occurred. On the day Nick's repeat year was confirmed, Dan collapsed at work. I received the news of Dan's poor health while working at the flower shop and was rushed to the hospital. At the hospital, Dan was undergoing treatment. After waiting for a while as Dan underwent treatment, I contacted Nick. However, even in such an emergency, he was nowhere to be seen. As I was dealing with this, the doctor who'd finished the treatment came to me to explain Dan's condition. Adams, Adams, your husband has barely survived, but the tests revealed that he has stage 4 pancreatic cancer. It's in the terminal stage. My husband has been has- I was at a loss for words upon hearing about his condition. We had always been blessed with health and had been living a life free from illness. And now terminal cancer, out of the blue. It was a continuous streak of misfortune. The doctor then began discussing treatment options, the choices for Dan were either to be hospitalized to live as long as possible or to receive palliative care at home and spend peaceful time there. I wanted to spend as much time with Dan as possible, but I knew the agony that cancer treatment could bring. So, I couldn't bring myself to say, go through cancer treatment. The decision on the future course of action was left entirely up to Dan. After a while, Dan who'd finished his treatment woke up. He received the same explanation from the doctor as I had it, Initially shocked and struggling to accept his physical condition, he pondered for a while and then decisively spoke. Jin know you, Stephanie. I want to spend my remaining time quietly with you. Let's go home. Just as I thought, I had a feeling he would say that. The thought of our remaining time being so limited was painful, but I respected Dan's wish and decided to go home with him. 
The suffering Dan must be enduring knowing death was imminent seemed much greater than mine. That day, we had dinner without a conversation. Dan spent the evening staring out the window, lost in thought. Meanwhile, Nick Adams didn't return home that day. The next morning, he staggered home in a hungover state. I'm home. Uh, my head hurts. Hey, where's my food? Nick, where have you been? You're coming back now? I called you so many times yesterday. Which to craft are you doing? I was really angry and irritated with Nick, who returned home nonchalantly without any worry despite his father, Dan Adams, being in a critical condition. Furthermore, upon returning, Nick was more concerned about his own meal than his father's health. I was appalled by Nick's behavior while his father was suffering. Having such a son made me feel incredibly sorry for Dan. A call? Oh, yeah, something about the daughter? So when's he could die? Wait, what? Nick, how can you say something like that? I scolded Nick harshly for using the word D towards his biological father. How could he say such a thing to his own father? Though currently, Dan is resting in the room. Even though the bedroom is far away, there's still a chance that Dan might wake up and hear Nick's insensitive remarks. The thought that Dan might have heard such comments was distressing to me. It's with that scary face. He got sick, so it can't be helped, right? Isn't it at the Dodard's fault for not noticing it until it got this bad? Listen. Nick. Pancreatic cancer is hard to detect until it progresses significantly. So it's not your father's fault. Please be kinder to him. I won't forgive you if you say such things in front of your father. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Chins, I'll be careful from now on. My serious talk and warning didn't seem to resonate with Nick at all. He just responded with casual replies and nods. His attitude made me feel sad and I couldn't help but sigh. Why did it turn out like this? Dan is Nick's only parent. Dan wasn't overly strict with his biological son. Nick. So, I couldn't understand why Nick was so resentful towards his father. Dan. To Nick. I might be just as undesirable as Dan. Nick simply dislikes being reprimanded by adults. So he probably finds the most joy and happiness in hanging out with delinquent groups. I'm worried and anxious about what will become of Nick, but for now, my top priority is to spend as much time as possible with Dan, whose time is limited. I decided not to let Nick's behavior affect me, and to cherish each day with Dan, wanting to live without regrets. After convincing myself to address Nick's issues later, Dan and I made some adjustments to our lives. Dan retired from his job, following his emergency hospitalization, and spent his days recuperating at home. I continued my part-time job at the flower shop, albeit with reduced hours, to spend as much time as possible with Dan. I thought staying indoors all day wouldn't be good for his mental and physical health, so I occasionally took Dan out in a wheelchair for walks in the neighborhood and down to the riverbank. Dan having been diagnosed with terminal cancer, rapidly lost weight and became quite frail. Despite his changed appearance, he remained the husband I loved, like me. Thank you for everything. Handling Nick must have been tough. I'm truly grateful for you, listening to my impossible requests. Hey, stop saying such things out of the blue. I just did what any wife would do. Dan, usually a man of few words, suddenly spoke up while looking towards the riverbank, which took me by surprise and almost brought tears to my eyes. No, I was really happy with your dedication. That's me. I know Nick is a difficult son, but I'll help as long as I can. Dan, thank you considering after his passing dan probably felt guilty about leaving nick my stepson entirely in my care but to me nick was no different from a biological child i never felt like dan was imposing nick on me however i understood dan's worry about leaving behind a son who was so unrestrained and difficult to manage after that we continued our silent walk and returned home when he got back a nick in a foul mood confronted us nick adams looking displeased suddenly said this, Peng, when have you been? Just walking around while having terminal cancer, seriously? I'm hungry. Hurry up and make some food. What a child. He doesn't come home some days and is irregular with his returns. Then, when he does come home at a decent hour, he dares to say things like this. Need to think, a college student. Not doing anything and demanding his parent to make food is just childish. What's the big deal? If you're hungry, you could just prepare something yourself. I thought to myself, while starting to cook quietly, so as not to raise my voice in front of Dan. But from that day, Dan started spending most of his time in the bedroom. Deeply engaged in some tasks, 
Sometimes when I went to check on him, he was intensely writing something. Maybe he was writing farewell letters to old friends while he still had the strength. Thinking of this, I made sure not to disturb him and quietly closed the bedroom door. Then three months later, Dan, who had been battling terminal cancer, passed away. I had braced myself for this eventuality, but accepting the reality that it happened just a few months after he fell ill was difficult. With a hollow feeling in my heart and unable to organize my thoughts, I began preparing for Dan's funeral. But to those around me, I must have looked expressionless and pale like a ghost. Losing Dan had wounded me more deeply than I had anticipated. Just amidst all this, I suddenly noticed Nick's cold attitude. At the moment Dan passed away, Nick had actually said this. Ah, finally he's gone. Always nagging like a meddling aunt. Saying, this is not allowed. That's not allowed. He never bought me games. And because of that, I was excluded by my classmates. Never got to travel. Really, that stubborn daughter was nothing but trouble. Such an insensitive thing to say just after his father had passed away. Nick showed no signs of sorrow. Seeing Nick like this, I felt a deep sadness, but my anger towards him was quickly rising. Fetch me. Nick, what did you just say? That's terrible. It's so unfair to your father. He set those limits because he wanted you to grow up to be a decent person. How can you not understand that? They correct your words right now. Huh, they correct my words? To a dead person. What's the point of that? Makes no sense. Instead of changing his attitude, Nick retorted with cold words. Hearing this, I was filled with sorrow. After that, Nick showed no signs of mourning his father's death and coldly watched as I arranged the funeral. During the funeral, he just stared blankly at Dan's portrait, disinterested and not concentrating. Throughout the funeral, as attendees greeted Nick and me, he just replied with a yes, yes, showing no sign of grief. Visitors seemed puzzled by his behavior. I was desperately hoping that Nick would behave decently, at least in this situation, but that hope was not fulfilled. The stares from the people who had come to pay their respects were piercing, and I felt a strong urge to escape from there. You weren't hard, Avani. It must have been tough. Really? Tiffany, you were at the heart of preparing everything. Well done. Somehow, I managed to get through the wake and the funeral, and I finally took a breath of relief. Despite the relatives appearing tired from all the hustle and bustle, they offered kind words to me. I hugged each of them, expressing my gratitude and thanks. After that lunch was distributed in another room at the funeral venue, and we took a lunch break. The somber atmosphere lightened up a bit, and everyone started reminiscing and sharing memories of Dan. However, one person was behaving differently. Nick sat down on a chair with a big attitude and sighed heavily. His inappropriate demeanor caught everyone's attention. Nick, there are relatives here. Please behave a little more appropriately. Shut up. I'm tired from the funeral. Besides, now that the funeral is over and all the hassle is done, I'm in a good mood. Let me enjoy it a bit more. I was taken aback by Nick's out-of-place comments and couldn't comprehend his attitude. I wait. Nick, you're in a good mood. What do you mean? Yeah, I'm feeling good right now. Then the words Nick uttered, while stretching out his whole body, made me lose my words in shock. His unexpected declaration echoed through the hall. Nick said this with a carefree face and a joking tone. At that moment, the entire gathering of relatives was shocked and froze, their gaze turning towards Nick. What? Nick, what's this about $200,000? What do you mean? I asked, filled with surprise and skepticism. Nick has always been careless with money, and there have been many troubling incidents before. But this amount he mentioned now truly shocked me. Well, you see, there was this car I'd been dying to have. It's a new model, very popular, so it wasn't easy to buy. I ordered it and waited three months for it, and now it's finally been delivered. Man, the dodo kicking the bucket was really lucky for me. Nick explained, laughing and showing off the bank account statement for the insurance money he received from our deceased husband. Hearing his story, I felt a surge of anger, but then, looking at the documents Nick was holding, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Well, that's unfortunate. I was secretly glad to have such an oblivious son. As I thought this, I quietly laughed to myself. Hey Nick, did you buy that new car with a loan? Of course. I made the deal for the new car ahead of time, knowing the insurance money would be deposited into this account. I'm so lucky he died. I even used his card, though the charge hasn't been withdrawn yet. Smart idea, huh? I'm pretty clever, aren't I? What an unbelievable situation. 
Nick had stolen Dan's credit card and used it without permission, anticipating that Dan would die soon and the credit card bill due the next month would be unpaid. Just as Nick had calculated, Dan passed away soon after the credit card was used. Nick must have thought everything went according to his plan, feeling elated about having access to free money. However, I calmly observed the bank account documents he was holding. That account was a joint one Dan and I used for managing household expenses, and the signature on the account was registered with mine. Indeed, the insurance money was deposited into that account the day before yesterday, but Nick seemed unaware of a significant fact. Nick, unfortunately, the insurance money wasn't deposited into that account. Then, Mom, what are you talking about? When I... It was supposed to be deposited there, right? Suddenly, when I revealed this shocking fact, Nick snorted in disbelief and flipped through the documents. They clearly showed the deposit of the insurance money with yesterday's date, and he smugly showed it to me. Look, the insurance money is definitely deposited here. Hey, are your eyes bad or what? Nick mocked me, but I already knew about the deposit being recorded in the bank account, even though I was busy after Dan's passing. It's impossible for me to forget that I was the one who handled the procedures. I know that. Nick! But unfortunately, that money is no longer in the account. What? It's not! Nick looked shocked and confused, just as I expected. No, that's wrong, right? It's clearly recorded here. Yes, it was there until yesterday. The yesterday. I transferred the insurance money to another account. The transfer? Nick hastily rechecked the bank statement, clearly surprised. That, indeed it only had records up to the day before yesterday. Naturally, there were no entries after that, so the transfer of the insurance money wasn't recorded. I deliberately didn't make a bank entry when I moved the money from one account to another. I was glad I moved the insurance money. The insurance money, early as a precaution, Nick had always been irresponsible with money, and caused us trouble numerous times. I was sure he would aim for Dan's insurance money, as I thought Nick fell into the trap and splurged, thinking he had access to the insurance money. What you're lying right, this account. Definitely has the insurance money if you think I'm lying, go check with the bank. Right now, I want them to prove what I'm saying is right. Really, Nick seemed to realize the truth in my firm rebuttal. Why would you do this? Why you're the one who thought about using your father's money without permission, that's the question. What do you mean? I've been inconvenienced by that dude for so long, it's only natural. For him to return the favor at the end, right saying that Nick angrily kicked a chair nearby the relatives present were stunned and speechless. I sighed deeply maintaining my composure as I faced Nick. It was time to teach Nick a lesson. He was the one who had truly inconvenienced me inconvenience. Who do you think has been inconvenienced? Do you know how much your father and I worried about you? We worked hard to earn the tuition for your university. And yet you spent your time playing really enough with the foolish son. Shut up, you did that on your own. Didn't you I don't care faced with a legitimate argument Nick was furious. And I exploded with anger the relatives present could do nothing but silently wait for our argument to settle. By the way, Nick you used your father's credit card without permission. What so what if I did? Well, you'll have to pay back what you used. What me pay didn't you know in inheritance matters the remaining balance on a deceased person's credit card. Is inherited by the heirs there's a will here from your father. Depending on the will's content, normally the money you spent yourself. You pay back right Nick's face paled as he heard this. He began to tremble realizing the reality of his situation. Such basic knowledge eluded him, and he used his father's credit card. What a careless thought thinking. Of this I planned to visit the probate court. As soon as possible the next day, I went to the court with the necessary documents to request verification of the will. It was honestly a challenge to get all the necessary documents in one day. Possible after a few days we received the date for the probate of the will, and Nick and I headed to the probate court. Together Nick was still reeling from the shock of having to pay. But he perked up thinking that Doddard must have had some decent assets, right that should wipe out any debt. Indeed upon checking, the will Dan's estate was extensive, including land apartments, stocks, and more amounting to a total of $8 million. Nick aware of his father's wealth had planned to inherit Dan's money, his laziness and desire to gain money without effort infuriated me, what the will contained was still unknown. But I wanted Nick to pay the price for the trouble he had caused over the years. Arriving at the court, the tension rose as the clerk opened the will only Nick. And I were present the room was filled with suspense article 1. I bequeath the following properties to my wife, Tiffany Adams Dan's largest apartment land, and various stocks were listed by the clerk. 
although specific names and addresses were withheld from Nick. I had a rough idea of which assets were being referred to the stocks, were all from major companies promising substantial profits, most of Dan's estate was to be inherited by me ensuring a comfortable income. Even after inheritance taxes article 2, I bequeathed the following properties to my eldest son Nick Adams, upon hearing the word properties Nick raised his hands and burst into joy. But I chuckled inwardly waiting to hear the rest. Furthermore, Nick Adams is to inherit all financial debts. The clerk listed the debts one by one upon hearing this Nick's jubilant behavior. Came to an abrupt halt. What debts? Why I wasn't told about this Well, your father had debts too. Plus the credit card bills. You racked up our substantial debts. What? Do I have to inherit debts like this? Nick finally realized the gravity of his actions. He was about to protest to the clerk. When I intervene, Nick, stop it, be quiet, quiet, why do I have debts? But I'm inheriting property too, right? I can offset the debts, then indeed Dan's will also mentioned that Nick would inherit properties along with the debts. However, I had realized something about these assets, the properties to be, properties to be inherited by Nick were, in fact, of little value. The stole departments and worthless rural lands wouldn't fetch much money. I remember to walk Dan and I had enjoyed before his passing, where he said he would help as long as he could. Perhaps that was reflected in this will. Most of Dan's valuable assets were left to me, while Nick was left with nearly worthless properties and debts. But to outsiders, this might seem cruel but considering Nick's past actions, I felt it was a fair choice. Nick, unfortunately, the properties you're inheriting are almost worthless. It's unlikely that selling them will cover all your debts. No way! How am I supposed to pay off these debts? Or Nick, in a fit of rage, slammed the table and began to protest. I remained calm, asked the clerk to leave, and started talking to Nick. Nick, it's your responsibility, isn't it? You've been lazy, causing trouble, and you misused your father's money. Complaining now is too late. Nick seemed to realize his foolishness. He collapsed to his knees, clinging to my feet, and began to plead. Mom, please, you're all I have left. Please help me. You've got a lot of assets now, right? That should be enough to clear my debts, right? However, I coldly brushed off his hand, and Nick coming to me only in times of need, acting humble and desperate. The Nick in front of me now was no longer the boy who once called me mom for the first time. I was determined not to be deceived by his cries of I'm mom, it was only when he needed something. Don't you dare to call me your mom? After all you've done, going against your father and me, and now you come crawling back when things get tough for you, the blood relation or not. I no longer consider you my son. Nick was crushed by despair and collapsed. I'd made up my mind to sever ties with him. Given everything he had done to us, it was the only option. I vowed to myself to cut ties with Nick once and for all. Nick didn't return home after that. After such turmoil, it made sense to keep our distance for a while. The house was quiet without Dan and Nick, and honestly, I felt relieved. Having Nick around would have only made things more complicated, so I found joy in being alone. Thank you for leaving the will. It in front of his portrait. I felt deep gratitude towards him. Despite the loneliness since Dan's passing, I was grateful for the property he left behind. The money he left ensured a secure future. Even though I was thankful, I continued working part-time at the florist. Being alone all the time only amplified the loneliness. Then Stmilliter. I heard that Nick started living in the dilapidated apartment he inherited from Dan. It was located far away, over an hour from school and far from the downtown area. To repay the $200,000 debt, Nick had to work part-time jobs. His commute to and from school became longer, leaving almost no time to hang out with friends. Moreover, he had to work late into the night every day, as a few hours of part-time work wasn't enough. Nick's life must have become quite challenging. However, I had no intention of helping him. It was all the result of his choices and actions. I couldn't bring myself to think of him as my son anymore. Maybe if one day Nick changes his heart and approaches me with the same honesty as before, I might consider helping him, be until that time comes. I'll mourn Dan's death and enjoy my solitary life.